Today is week four of our series on the subject of grace. Initially, it was going to be a four-week series. We're going to end it today because we have a couple of you know, these activities that are coming up through December. We're going to extend this into January. So there'll be at least a couple more messages on the topic of grace as we move forward. And, um, but it's just, been, it's, it's just so important you know, that I definitely want to revisit this as we're moving to the new year. Um, we're going to do a quick review. Week one, we asked this question, what is grace? And in its simplified term, grace is unmerited favor, meaning it's a gift from God that's undeserved, cannot be earned. And the moment that we try to earn it is the moment that it ceases to be grace, right? When we all work at our jobs at the end of your pay period, it's not unreasonable to expect that you're going to get paid. Why? Because you worked for it. You earned it, right? You put in the hours. You did the job. You completed the task. If you didn't get paid, you likely wouldn't continue to go to work. We earn our paychecks, but we cannot earn grace. And then we said that grace is better experienced than explained. And while we need an explanation of grace, mere explanation is not enough. Until you experience it, you really just don't get it. Kind of like romantic love. You have to experience it to get it. Week two, we looked at John chapter one, verse 14, where it says the word became flesh. Brent and I were just talking about this this morning. That's talking about Jesus. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. And we talked about how truth is necessary to fully receive grace. This is very important. Our ability to experience and appreciate grace is directly related to our willingness to acknowledge our need for it. In other words, the more I recognize the ugliness of my sin, the more I can appreciate the beauty of God's grace. So radical grace requires brutal honesty. And then last week we talked about how giving grace to we talked about giving grace to ourselves and We talked about leaving behind regret and shame and allowing God's grace to empower us to be who God says that we are. We're not defined by our mistakes. We're not defined by our regret or our shame. And here's the final point um, from last week. I think it's worth repeating. Regret is connected to behavior. Shame is connected to identity. And so regret says I made a mistake. Shame says I am a mistake. Regret says I failed Shame says I am a failure, and we own that as part of our identity, and that's the difference between regret and shame. All of us have regret from time to time, but we should not allow that to pull us into a place of shame to say this regret is who I am. Does that make sense? See, a lot of us spending time, and this is a great sentence, I got this from God, uh, from Grace is Greater. A lot of us spend time running away from God because it feels like He's chasing us to collect a debt that we owe, but in reality, He's chasing us to give us something we could never afford. God's grace is more than we deserve, greater than we could ever imagine. All right. Today I want to talk about giving grace to others. Anybody ever struggle giving grace or mercy or forgiveness to somebody else? Good. So at least six of us are going to get something out of this. Um, The truth is that's a difficult question because it has a lot of nuance. It has it really depends on the scenario, doesn't it? Who is the person who wronged me? Do I know them? Like, you know, those of you that experience road rage and somebody honks at you and you get all jacked up, it's easy to kind of forget about that a couple hours later. You know, if you're still brewing two hours later, you got problems. But usually, usually you've kind of moved on, right? Who is wrong me? Do I know them? Are they an acquaintance or are they a close friend or family member? How did the person wrong me? That often shapes my, am I going to give forgiveness or am I going to give grace to others? Was it accidental? Was it intentional? See, last week I said that for the most part, we believe God's grace is available without limit for others, but we often have difficulty believing that God's grace is sufficient for ourselves. Now, while this is true in general terms, for most of us, again, this statement comes with a lot of contingencies. So can we be real for a minute? I talk to all kinds of people about all kinds of things. And generally, the things that people are dealing with don't affect me directly. All right. So, for example, someone might come to me and say, look, I'm struggling with pornography. Or someone might say, I'm struggling with alcoholism or drug addiction, etc. While these are things that make me sad and they I have compassion and I'm praying with folks over these things. 
they don't affect my family directly. Now, if you've ever come to me with a situation, don't take this as if I'm saying I don't care. That's not at all. I, I care deeply and greatly. And I sincerely want all of us to be healthy and whole. So I'm talking about grace for others. See, we say that we believe God's grace is limitless. How many of you agree with that statement? God's grace is limitless. But do we really believe that? It's easy to offer grace to others when the offense doesn't affect me personally. All right, so let's talk about some scenarios that do affect us personally. And some of these are not going to be easy to talk about. And I don't want to stir controversy in our hearts or in our minds. I want to stir our minds to think beyond surface level Christianity. I want us to think beyond our church cliches And I want us to dig a little deeper into our actual belief systems. All right? So statistics tell us that one in nine girls under the age of 18 are victims of sexual abuse or assault. Another source I read said that one in 20 boys are also victims. So while these next couple of scenarios are made up, I realize that there are people in this room that have experienced abuse just statistically at some point in your life. And it's not my heart to be insensitive to that. Babe, can you just check the back? I don't know, it's like a flood of children having to pee all of a sudden. <laughs> I don't know if they're giving out sweet tea. During... <laughs> I'm grateful for our kids. <clears throat> that, that's true, but it is distracting me this morning. And this is important. I think God's got a message for us today. And uh, I, I don't ever want it to be us against them. I'm thankful that we have this problem right here. I would much rather have this than, than a church with no children. So don't let my ADD and my ability to focus think, to make you think I don't care about our kids. I'm glad they're here. Uh, but I was losing my mind. Okay. <laughs> All right, so again, while these next couple scenarios are, some, are, are made up, I know that, that it's sensitive. It's a sensitive topic, all right? Scenario number one, we're talking about offering grace to others. Your 15-year-old daughter gets pregnant by her 17-year-old boyfriend. Is God's grace still limitless? It's very easy to say yes on the front end, but not as easy if you've lived through that scenario. Let's go a little bit further. Your 14-year-old daughter gets pregnant by her 16-year-old boyfriend. Is God's grace still limitless? Yeah, we know scripturally it is, but the the pill gets more difficult to swallow. Your 12-year-old daughter gets pregnant by a 17-year-old boy who's not her boyfriend, just a boy who took advantage of her. Is God's grace still limitless? We know theologically and mentally that God's grace is still limitless. But what I'm talking about today is us offering grace to others and forgiveness. And when it crosses a line that affects us personally, how, what's, what's really underneath the surface? You start digging a little bit. What's really under there? You read the headlines of how a drunk driver crossed the center line and crashed into a family, family of four, killing three of them. And while the news is tragic, it makes you sad, it causes you pause to a moment to be thankful that it wasn't you, is God's grace still limitless? Because it didn't, maybe didn't affect you personally, we would say yes. A drunk driver crosses the center line, crashes into your family. One of your family members is now gone. Is God's grace still limitless? Is God's grace as limitless for the murderer as it is for the liar? Is God's grace as limitless for the rapist as it is for the shoplifter? Look, and I know that these are heavy questions. We could go on and on talking about worst case scenarios like these. And while a lot of us in the room have not been affected by tragedies like this, some of us have. And again, the reason that I even bring this up is I want to challenge the deepest parts of our belief systems. Because the reality is, I think that most of us have been poorly prepared for what to do when we are deeply wronged. And our culture certainly isn't offering any Christ-like insight. What would happen to the world around us if we were not selective in who we offered grace to? How would the world respond if we just simply offered grace? 
Because grace is not only a gift for us, it's a gift for all. God uses us to be carriers of his grace into a hurting and broken world. Now, in the midst of this challenge to think deeper than surface level about the grace that we offer others, I want to offer point number one, which is this. Grace flows. Grace flows. From God to us to others. I mean, the reason that we're here today is because someone, someone showed us grace. A parent, a friend, a co-worker, a spouse. Someone introduced you to the grace of God. And that's why you're in this room today. In the words of Max Licato, he says, quote, He dispenses his goodness not with an eyedropper, but a fire hydrant. Your heart is a Dixie cup and his grace is the Mediterranean Sea. You simply can't contain it all. So let it bubble over, spill out, and pour forth. Amen. Grace flows. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 8, Jesus said, Freely you have received, freely give. Amen. What we're about to read in Matthew 18 helps us understand the greatness of the grace we've received, but it also helps us to understand the greatness of the grace that we are to give because grace is a two-way street. Receiving grace but refusing to give it is not an option for a Christ follower. Grace always flows. Matthew chapter 18, a very popular passage of Scripture. Matthew 18, beginning at verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. And he says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. 10,000 bags of gold. One commentary I read put it this way. I'm reading from the commentary. One of the servants who was brought before the king owed him the astronomical figure of 10,000 talents or bags of gold, depending on which version you're reading. Now, depending on how you calculate things like inflation, gold prices and so forth, the modern value of this figure can change quite a bit. But generally speaking, a talent or a bag of gold was about as much money as a low-level laborer would make in 20 years. The sum Jesus mentions here is so large that it becomes meaningless to calculate the exact number. Because this is, this is literally many thousands of lifetimes worth of debt. All right, so using the math in this commentary, the laborer owed him 200,000 years Worth of debt. Verse 25. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. Aren't you glad Jesus canceled our debt? But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay me what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. And instead, he went off and had the man thrown into the prison until he could pay the debt. Once again, for context, he had just been forgiven 200,000 years worth of debt, but he's refusing to forgive a couple months worth of debt that was owed to him. Verse 31. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and they went and told their master everything that had happened. And then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And in anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. Listen to these words. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you, and thus you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Man, this is a heavy, heavy story. Peter asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive someone who's wronged me? I've heard Bible teachers say that Jewish tradition held that you only had to forgive someone three times. The fourth time someone sinned against you, you didn't have to forgive them. 
Well, I don't know if that's completely ag- accurate regarding Jewish tradition. It's definitely not too far away from the way we respond to people. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Essentially, I'm not going to continue to forgive you. Maybe Peter thought he was being generous by taking the amount of times from four to seven. And then Jesus responds, not seven, but 77. Some versions say 70 times seven. But just like the bags of gold are metaphorical, so is this number of forgiveness. Jesus is saying, you forgive every time. You show grace every time. And if you were brought up in church, you probably heard this story that Jesus told many different times. But I wanted to point out something that I only recently learned. Through the series, I've mentioned several times that Jesus didn't have to preach about grace, that he was full of grace. Anybody remember me saying that throughout the series? We talked about how everywhere he went, grace spilled out of him onto others. But there's one group of people that he wasn't very gracious to. The religious leaders of the day. Jesus had no tolerance for those who had no grace. Go back to verse 31. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. So in the middle of this story about grace, we find a lack of grace for the one person who isn't gracious. Grace is so big and so powerful that it should affect every part of our lives. Jesus extended grace to everyone he met who was caught in sin, except for the Pharisees, whose sin was essentially refusing to be gracious. The verse says that they were outraged. This is translated deeply grieved. They saw a man who had received great grace and yet refused to show grace to others. And the people who saw it were broken hearted. They were deeply, deeply grieved. Our lives should be marked by grace. Our churches should be known by grace. Again, every part of us should be influenced by grace. And when we see fellow believers showing little to no grace to others, we should be outraged and deeply grieved. But instead, often the church is known for its outrage towards people outside of our community who need grace rather than the people inside of our community who've refused to give it. We're too busy trying to change everybody else. Oh, this, I'm so outraged by what this person's doing. Don't be surprised when sinners act like sinners. Why should we be surprised about that? Shouldn't get all worked up and jacked up over this kind of stuff when there are people inside of our, our own ranks that are just treating people like garbage. And we got to call people out and say, you got to stop acting like that. Somebody's life is hanging in the balance because of the way we show grace to people. Remember Hebrews 12, 15. See to it that no one misses the grace of God. Not forgiving others, not showing grace to others is a really, really big deal to God. Verse 32. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And his anger, he... As ang- in his anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back all he owed. We know mathematically this was actually impossible. He was sentenced to life in prison. And then Jesus says again, this is how my heavenly father will treat us unless we forgive our brother or sister from our heart. Look, the words of Jesus present us with difficult choices. Simple to understand, but difficult to do. See, it's easy to forgive when the offense is non-consequential, meaning it's easy for me to forgive if that doesn't really affect me. It's easy for me to show you grace if it's not personal. But what do you do when it is personal? What do you do when the offense comes at the hand of someone you love? What do you do when the offense and you're wronged and it comes at the hand of someone you trust and you count on? And we already discussed some several several difficult made-up scenarios earlier in the message but let's be more specific how do we show grace how do we forgive when your ex is or has trying to make your life miserable how do we forgive or show grace when your neighbor has become nasty toward your family and made your home a place of chaos how do we forgive a mom who constantly yelled at you or put you down 
or a father who seems completely oblivious to your existence? How do we forgive that close friend who betrayed us? How do we forgive the spouse who cheated on us or the relative who who abused you? Look, I'm not insinuating that this is an easy journey. And if you've been deeply wounded by someone, I'm in no way trying to make light of that Make light of that hurt or that pain or the anger that you felt. Of course you're angry. It's natural to get angry. Sometimes it's even appropriate to be angry. right? Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anger and a foothold for the devil are connected. The word foothold here in the Greek is the word topos, and it means an inhabited place. Don't allow the enemy through anger to have a place to live in your spiritual life. It means opportunity, power, or occasion for acting. See, when we do not deal with our anger, we are allowing Satan to take up residence. We're literally giving the enemy opportunity, power, and occasion to act. We have to deal with our anger, which means we have to forgive. We have to give grace. Listen to some of the effects that anger can have on our lives. According to an article in the New York Times, says this, quote, researchers have gathered a wealth of data suggesting that chronic anger is so damaging to the body that it ranks with or even exceeds cigarette smoking, obesity, and a high-fat diet as a powerful risk factor for early death. Ranks with or exceeds. 2,000 plus years after the great missionary Paul writes, anger isn't good for you, scientists show up and confirm anger isn't good for you. All right, we're running out of time. I'm going to move through the rest of this quickly. I'm going to give us three warning signs of repressed anger. And then we'll wrap this up with three practical but difficult steps to forgive. All right, how do I know if I'm carrying repressed anger? All right, number one, when we become disproportionately angry over little things. When I become disproportionately, disproportionately angry over little things, it could be a sign that I have repressed anger. It's, it's those, well, that escalated quickly moments. You come in and you're like, how's your day? And you're like, oh. Okay, it wasn't good. I, okay, okay. Immediately, when that happens in my house, which doesn't happen really, because but if it did, I'd be like, what do you want me to clean? I would just start cleaning. <laughs> Our boys aren't in diapers anymore, but I'd start changing diapers. Making the bed, I just take it out of the trash. <laughs> just kidding. I'm not kidding. That's what I would do. But she's never, she's never acted like that. When I become disproportionately angry over little things, again, it's these those that escalated quickly moments. It's the guy waiting on the elevator. You've walked up on that. He's stressed. He's just pushing the button. Come on, come on, come on. It's just it's the rage you feel when 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 the light won't turn green. You ever been in a hurry and it feels like your red light takes four years? You know, you got you know you got repressed anger when you're just sitting there just getting, oh, you're so angry at the whole world and our federal government and local government. Why can't they make the light turn quicker? <laughs> Look, I'm not saying that we should never get angry. I'm saying that a sign of repressed anger is when our anger is disproportionate to the actual event. Number two, sign of repressed anger when we complain about everything. Kyle Eidelman says this about uh, repressed resentment. He says, quote, people who repress resentment over hurt they've received tend to see everything through a negative lens. They constantly complain about teachers, coworkers, neighbors, relatives, servers, and other drivers. They can find the negative in anything. And instead of seeing the world through the lens of grace, they see the world through the lens of bitterness. Complaining about everything. Number three, we're overly sensitive and defensive. <clears throat> now, maybe you're like me. You think, I'm not really overly sensitive or defensive. I know I'm not because nobody's ever told me that I'm overly sensitive or defensive. Or do you know why no one's ever told you that you're overly sensitive <laughs> and defensive? Your laughter says you know the answer. They haven't told you because you're overly sensitive and defensive. Look, these are self-explanatory. I'm not going to spend a lot more time on them. But I will say this. You need to find someone that you're close to and ask them if this describes you. Because remember, receiving grace requires truth. Radical grace requires brutal honesty. 
And if we're not willing to face the truth about ourselves or our anger, we're not ready to receive healing and grace. Just this week, I, I went over this list with Katie, and she wasn't really willing to see her blind spots. And so I had to point them out to her about how she gets so disproportionately angry over things. Listen, I did go over this list. I sent her this text message. It'll be hard for some of you to see. <clears throat> and I said three, three signs of repressed anger or bitterness from wounds. One, disproportionately angry over little things. Two, complain about everything. Three, overly sensitive and defensive. And, defensive. and she sent me the eyes. <laughs> so I said, I'm sometimes number one. I try not to be number two. And I used to be worse about number three, but I think I'm getting better. And she just said, all true. <laughs> So thanks, babe, for the encouragement. <laughs> the truth is that I used to be so overly sensitive and defensive. If she would have sent the eyes and the all true text to me, I would have been I would have pouted for a long time, maybe for a couple of days, maybe for a couple of weeks. She's like, are you still mad at me? And I'm like, yeah, you know, I would say no, but I would just pout for like, anyway. All right. We become disproportionately angry. We complain about everything. We're overly sensitive and defensive. If this describes you, listen, deal with your anger and deal with your bitterness. Because if you don't, it will take a serious toll on your life. It will. And I'm, 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 I'm walking through this. Right? This is my life. I try not to complain, but sometimes I do. You know, we spent a large portion of this year talking about being before doing. And my schedule, because of the remodel and the events and things, have been a lot of doing and less being. And I feel it right now. I've not been a good example to our staff. I've not been a good example to you. I broke my Sabbath this week. Tonight we're doing Sabbath. Six o'clock. Don't call me unless somebody's dead. <clears throat> Is that too harsh? Let me just... <laughs> oh my God, forgive me, Jesus. <laughs> Anyway, that's my confession to you. I haven't been a good example over the last two weeks. I haven't been a good example to my family. We just go, 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 go. Too much doing, not enough being. But if this describes you, deal with your anger because it'll have a serious toll on your life. And part of that is our doing and being. When we just don't have space for the voice of the Lord in our lives, it just, that's when those things begin to manifest in our lives. All right, quickly, three things about forgiveness. All right, number one, acknowledge it. I want to look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. A moment ago, we read a portion of a letter that was originally written to the church in Ephesus from Ephesians. That would be modern day Turkey. This letter uh, that we're about to read is from the same person, Paul. It was written to Timothy, who was his protege, but he was the pastor of the church in Ephesus. All right, so Paul says this to his protege, Timothy. He says, verse 14, Alexander, the metal worker, did me a great deal of harm. Paul doesn't spend a lot of time describing it. He doesn't complain about it. He simply states what happened. Sometimes we try to pretend that nothing happened. We cannot, re we cannot forgive what we refuse to acknowledge. So if you're not willing to acknowledge it, then you can't release it. We can't forgive it. All right, number two. I'm going to move quickly through these. Number two is this. So number one, acknowledge it. Number two, release my rights. See, for a lot of us, after acknowledging, acknowledging that we've been wrong, we're ready for revenge. You hurt me, so I'm going to hurt you. That's the American way. You don't mess with me, you don't mess with my family, and you certainly don't mess with my political party because I'm coming after you. When we act like this, we got major problems. Let's look again at the words of Paul. Verse 14, Alexander, the metal worker, did me a great deal of harm. Watch what he says. The Lord will repay him for what he's done. Paul doesn't minimize the hurt he felt. He simply releases his right to take revenge. This is different than releasing our feelings of anger and rage. All right. You have to release those feelings, but you have to also have to release the offender. He's releasing the offender and saying, look, it's not on me. The Lord's taking care of it now. I'm not going to hold the right to get revenge. I'm not holding the right to get even. I'm not. That's not my place anymore. I'm forgiving him. This is what he did. I'm releasing it. The Lord will take care of it from here. Look, and I know this isn't easy, right? especially if the offense is something devastating. But giving grace to others is necessary in order to receive grace from God. Number three, pray for them. I know it seems, maybe that seems like a cop out or cliche, but yeah. let's drop to verse 16. At my first defense, 
No one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. Watch his words. May it not be held against them. Amen. Praying for our enemies didn't originate with Paul. It originated with Jesus. When he shows up on the scene and says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Which was a big deal. Because everybody sitting there, that audience, grew up their entire lives here. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. You hurt me, I hurt you. You punch my tooth out, I'll punch yours out. This, he says, don't do that. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Jesus shows up, flips the script. And then he exemplified this behavior when he was on the cross. What did he say when he was on the cross? He's hanging there, naked, nailed to a cross, about to die. And he says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Prayed for his enemies. This prayer was echoed by Stephen later in the New Testament, who was the first martyr, the first person to lose his life because of his faith in the New Testament. Ironically, Stephen's murder was authorized by Paul, who we're reading about before Paul had met Jesus. So Stephen prayed the same prayer as he was having rocks thrown at him. He's, they take him outside of the city. They're stoning him. They're murdering him because of his faith. And as he was dying, he prayed, Lord, do not hold this sin against him. He's forgiving and releasing and praying for his enemies. Fast forward to Paul. He's been left alone. And, in his response is the, and then his response is the same. May it not be held against them. Three steps, forgiveness. Acknowledge it, release our rights, and pray for them. Adrian, you can come and play. I want to quickly go back to Paul's instructions to Timothy. I want to read through this again and go back to verse 4. We skipped verse 15, but I want to go back to it. Alexander, the metal worker, did, great, did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he's done. Acknowledge, release of rights. Now watch the caution from the next verse. Verse 15, you too should be on guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. Just because we show grace and forgiveness to an offender doesn't mean that we have to immediately trust them again. Amen. There may be times that we never trust that person again. Grace and forgiveness are not contingent on reconciliation. Grace also is not a get out of jail free card. Jesus took our eternal penalty. But here, there are still consequences for our actions. Should we reconcile when possible? Yes, because that's what the gospel is. The grace of God reconciles us back to himself. But there are situations that are so broken that it truly ir irreconcilable. I don't believe that God expects us to live in abusive situations. He doesn't, ex he doesn't expect us to well, I mean, you can paint, paint an image of your own scenario, but whatever it is that we're living through, he doesn't expect us to be abused mentally, sexually, physically. That's not, that's not part of my commitment when I come into covenant or relationship with someone. And there may be moments that I've that someone, my children, for instance, let's just use that as an example, right? It's my job as their father to protect them. And so there may be moments where something had happened to them and I have to now put a guard up and say, I'm going to protect them. I give you grace. I release what happened to you, to the Lord. I release what you've done to the Lord. I've forgiven you. I still love you. But relationship is no longer an option until trust is earned again. I don't believe God expects us to remain in abusive situations, but he does expect us to show grace, grace to others. Paul said, hey, he wronged me. I'm releasing it to the Lord, but you need to be careful. Be careful. And so I say that as an encouragement to us because there's a lot, sometimes there's, there's a lot of confusion when we're wronged and it feels like, it feels like I'm breaking God's command to not reconcile with this relationship. And I'm not just talking about marriage relationships. I mean, that's you know, probably the one that's in the forefront because that's a covenant relationship between you and God and, the, and your spouse. And we should do everything we can to reconcile those things. But I'm saying at the same time, we can't live in abusive situations. You can release them to the Lord. You can show grace and you can forgive them also not coming back together. And 
And again, this has, you know, that, that feels like a blanket statement and it has a lot of moving parts and nuance and everybody's situation is different. And what God may speak to you may be different than what he might speak to somebody else, unless it's like clear in the word of God. Like there's, there's black and white in scripture, like, right? We get that. There's do's and don'ts, so to speak. But there are other areas that are gray, right? Jesus said, like, for instance, a, a, a divorce could be, divorce is okay in, in, the, in the event of infidelity, okay? So a partner cheats on someone, a divorce happens, and then, or maybe the divorce doesn't happen. This, this is the point I was trying to make. So someone may divorce after an extramarital affair and be within their rights biblically. But someone else may stay together and work through that and let that be reconciled. And the end result is that it's better, their marriage is better than it ever was on the front end because of the work that they put in. That's a, that's a decision that's, that we have to make between us and the Lord. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. I'm trying to be careful not to make blanket statements and, and, give, I don't, and I don't want to give people loopholes and be like, oh, the pastor said I could just, and you're like, peace out, bro. Dude. <laughs> that's not what I'm saying. Right? We have to be in tune with the Holy Spirit and we have to understand and know his word. You can't just be going happenstance, just doing whatever you want. Say, oh, the Lord told me this. Well, first of all, take it to scripture. If it doesn't line up with scripture, then it's not right. I don't have enough time to unpack all of that. I mean, this whole, this whole thing needs like its whole year-long series. You know, I know that there's a lot in that. But I think practically speaking, going back to, to these three points, if you're carrying bitterness from your wounds, this is one of the signs of that, and you have repressed anger. Disproportionate angry over little, disproportionately angry over little things complain about everything and overly sensitive and defensive if you already know that's you then you got to deal with it if you don't know if you're like i don't know if that's me or not have an honest conversation with your with your spouse and don't pout about it when they say yeah it's kind of you when they send you the eyes or whatever like if you're gonna have the conversation look grace requires honesty you want to be better do you want to be the same i want to be better i want my life to be better there are areas of my life that I struggle with. I'm not perfect just because I'm up here on this. You know what I mean? Just because I'm the one that has the microphone. I talked to a counselor this week on the phone. I called her up and we were talking through some things. I was like, hey, this is what's going on in my life. You know, I need to see people so I can not lose my mind. So we're talking about what that would look like maybe in January. And I don't, I don't say that so that you think I'm crazy. I'm saying that so that you think you're not crazy. Because so, sometimes when there's this stigma of like, if I need counseling, if I have to see a therapist or if I have to see somebody, that God's not active in my life. That's not true. Amen. Sometimes we need help to go to that next step. And I'm committed to being better. You know why? Because I want to be honest. I want to be authentic. And when I get with, with, with somebody who's speaking into my life, I just, it probably feels like I vomit all over them. This is like, this is going on. And I did this and I said this and I wish I wouldn't have. And I did whatever and blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, bro, slow down. I just want to be better. I want to be the best version of myself. And I want you to be the best version of yourself. I want you to be who God's called you to be. Like I'm getting way off script here. Actually, the script's over. I already said everything I had typed in. It's just, there's a lot of nuance. There's a lot of things. So find somebody that you can honestly ask those questions to. Somebody who knows you well. Am I overly... Anger, is it disproportionate? Am I overly sensitive? You know, ask somebody those questions. And then if you've been wronged, the person who's created those feelings inside of you, acknowledge it, re release your right for revenge, and pray for them. There's probably 12 more steps we could put on there, but that's the three. Acknowledge it, release it, pray for them. And you're like, I don't want to pray for him. That's why you got to pray for him. Okay, let's pray. God. On behalf of Pastor Randy and the entire staff at Everyday Church, we'd like to thank you for joining us today. For more information on the church, please visit us at everydaychurch.xyz.